One complaint that I see regularly on social media is that the MMT does not consider loans by the private sector to the by the private banks to the private sector. I, they leave out the endogenous creation of money, which has been a topic in post Keynesian economics certainly ever since Basil Moore in the 1970s, and you can find the same arguments in Joseph Schumpeter and Fisher, Irving Fisher back in the 1930s. Now, practically speaking, that's true. I've rarely seen a discussion of private money creation by an MMT author, but there's no problem about including it. And of course, Ravel makes that totally feasible because just as governments create money by double entry bookkeeping, so do the private sector. But the, imp the impact of the private sector creating that money is the debt of the non-bank private sector to the banks, whereas the impact of the government doing that is reserves in the, uh, in the assets of the banking sector. So if I want to include uh, private money creation, I have to add an additional asset of the banking sector, which is loans. Well, let's do that. So here's the uh, godly table for the private banks. Let's make it zoom in a bit there. Plus to add another asset, and I'll call this loans. And then we have lending by the banks to the uh, so bank lending to the private sector, and that le loans, but the, w w what word should I use for it here? When you look at how accountants define debt, they call uh, debt, a, uh, they describe the amount of money you owe as a debt, and the rate of change of the amount of money you owe is credit. So I'm going to call this flow of credit, which is an increase or decrease in dollars per year of the amount of money owed by the banks. Now if the banks give you, put credit dollars per year into your bank accounts, then they do that with a matching entry, increasing the debt you owe to them of loans. And that is the essence of the post-Keynesian insight that bank lending creates money. Because it deposits a part of the money supply, with credit dollars per year being added to the, uh, to the loans that are out outstanding, credit dollars per year is added to the money supply as well. So loans create deposits. And of course, that also creates an obligation to pay interest and have interest on loans. And that is a payment from the deposit account of the private sector at the banks to the banks. So I've got, uh, pardon me, that should be a negative. So the money comes out of the deposit accounts and goes into the short-term equity of the banking sector. And that's that's why the banks, of course, offer loans. They, they want an interest, interest income out of it. So I now, having done that, I've now got to, um, uh, and I've got an error down there, courtesy of typing the wrong number in the first instance. I'll just see if I can delete that and get rid of it. Delete that there, okay. So we now have credit dollars per year uh, being added to the assets. Of course, now I've got the uh, private sector, uh, Non, the private non-bank sector having an extra liability, which is loans. So I've now got that properly covered. And where did the interest payments come from? And that should be minus in there. Let's actually correct that. Deposits fall. That then reduces the equity of the private sector. So we now have included, and I'll just actually, yeah, that's all, cor that's all correct. Let's take a look at it. So I've got government money creation, and bond sales taking up the first five rows of this particular table, and credit money creation by the banking sector, and interest on loans uh, by the banking sector charged to the private sector, shown on this line. So I've now got a mixed model of both fiat money creation by the government and credit money creation by the banking sector. And that's, gen generally speaking, that's the world in which we live. We live in a system with a mixed combination of private money creation by loaning, creating loans, and government money creation by creating reserves. And that's the real world. Now what I'm going to do in the next set of videos is show how we can use this to analyze economic events which the mainstream of neoclassical economists have never been able to understand and never explain, and that's the boom of the 1920s and the crash of the 1930s. They have no explanation for either. I can easily show using Ravel what caused the boom and what caused the crash